Praise the Lord. Welcome you to our live broadcast this Sunday, February 23, 2020. Shall we pray? In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for today. We commit all things into your hands. We commit this teaching, O oh God, to your people. That through the hearing of this word, they may be delivered from the bondage that the enemies of the gospel have imposed on them. May your countenance, O oh God, shine upon all of us, enlightening our hearts, that we may embrace this truth. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Don't forget, we have a WhatsApp link now for World Evangelicals. You can click on the link below to join us. Thank you. Today's topic, tithes and offerings in the New Testament church. Outline, introduction. Number two, tithes and offerings in the Old Testament. Three, offerings in the New Testament. Four, the Jerusalem Council. Five, Tithing in the New Testament is a doctrine of human beings. 6. Context of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. 7. What to do? Praise the Lord. Introduction. Many 21st century pastors and general overseers preach miracles rather than the miracle worker. Gifts rather than the giver of life. Prosperity rather than righteousness. Church attendance rather than holiness. Signs and wonders rather than the fruit of the Spirit. Tithes and offerings rather than feeding the poor. And building projects rather than missionary work. There is anarchy in our worship in our preaching and in our teaching lots of noise and little or no heartfelt praise many children of God and these are the ones who are born again in truth and indeed that is in the actions don't appreciate the following that children of God are stewards in the kingdom of God. Two, that stewards' lives, talents, time, and wealth belong to God 100% since Christ purchased those lives with his blood. Three, it is the responsibility of a steward to husband the life of God in him or her and to manage the resources which is time, talents and wealth that God has given him or her. Four, stewards are accountable to God on how they live their life and how, how they utilize those, that time, the talents and resources in advancing the mission of God which is presenting the salvation message Christ crucified for humanity's sins to a dying world in both words and deeds. That is, the world must see Christ in their lives for them to believe the gospel of Christ. It is the responsibility of stewards to seek the Lord's will on how to manage those resources God has put in their care. Stewards with the aid of the Holy Spirit must examine old covenant practices and doctrines through the prism of the new covenant or they will be led astray. And we are doing one of those things today. 
Stewards must consult the Holy Spirit in all matters, not in some, all. They cannot take unilateral decisions. Because in addition to being the seal of our salvation, the Holy Spirit is our guide and teacher of God's word. We shall now examine the subject of tithes and offerings using God's word. God's word, the scriptures, must supersede every other teaching on the subject. And my prayer is that the Lord God will open our eyes of understanding. So that we may situate the subject matter within the context of Christ's finished work at Calvary. Praise the Lord. We shall go to the second item on the outline. Tithes and offerings in the Old Testament. The laws on tithes and offerings were part of the covenant between God and Israel. God's covenant with Israel was holistic. The people did not have the option to pick and choose. Disobedience in one made the loss of favor with God, and there were severe consequences. Therefore, those who teach that tithes are for the New Testament church are in error. If we have to tithe, then we must obey all the Old Testament laws that God gave to the children of Israel. And if we are still subject to the law, then Christ died in vain. Before the law, there was giving, a giving of a tent, but it was free will given, it was not commanded. In Genesis chapter 14, verses 20 to 24, we will read that Abraham chose to give a tenth of the spoils of war to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. It was a free will giving. And we also read in Genesis chapter 28, verses 22, second portion, of Jacob's vow to God, where he said, And of all that you give me, I will surely give you a tenth to you. It was free will. It was not commanded. He of his own volition made that vow. Praise the Lord. Then came the law. And within the law, governing God's relationship with the children of Israel, there were three types of giving. Three types. One was commanded, tithes, a tenth of the first fruits and livestock. The second was commanded offerings peace offering, bond offering, sin offering, trespass, free will offerings. Then you had the third part, which were free will offerings, where people voluntarily gave what they wanted to do. It was not commanded. Praise the Lord. So let us look at the law of the tithes that God gave to the children of Israel. The law that governed God's relationship with the children of Israel. Number one, there were tithes for the Levites. Who were the Levites? They were of the tribe of Levi or Levi. They didn't get any land allocation when the Israelites entered the promised land. Hence, God had to provide a law or to make the law that they have to make provision for the Levites who were servants in the temple and in the tabernacle prior to the temple it was a tabernacle of course so we're going to read the first scripture today behold i have given the children of levi all the tithes in israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting praise the lord the second tithe commanded was for the benefit of everybody in the congregation, meaning the whole of Israelites. Shall we read the second scripture? You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Praise the Lord. 
The third tithe commanded was for the benefit of the stranger, the widow, the fatherless, and the Levite. Shall we read the next scripture? At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. Praise the Lord for the reading of his word. As we can see from the three scriptures, the first one where tithes were for the Levites. They had no inheritance in Israel, as we already said. And then for the whole congregation, the Israelites to eat and rejoice in the presence of the Lord. And lastly, for the poor and the widows. Those were the three in the commanded, that's God's command on the law of the tithes. Then we had offerings in Israel. There were free will offerings. And two types of them. They commanded offerings, but there was a free will offering. So within the offering, we have commanded and we have free will. In the commanded offerings, we have peace offering, burnt offering, sin offering, trespass offering. But there were free will offerings. So we're going to take a look at two instances of free will offerings. That's where individuals, on their own volition, gave offerings. We're going to read the next scripture. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle, for the performance of its rituals, and for the sacred garments. Praise the Lord. This was the tabernacle while still in the desert. People on their own, aided by the Holy Spirit, they were moved and they brought offerings to the Lord on their own. It wasn't commanded. Shall we read the next scripture? When they arrived at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the family leaders made voluntary offerings toward the rebuilding of God's temple on its original site. Praise the Lord. The children of Israel, some have come back from exile and they had to rebuild the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. And we see these offerings for the construction of the second temple. People made voluntary offerings. There was no tithe, no command. They did it on their own. Praise the Lord. We're going to move to the third item on the outline. Offerings in the New Testament. We didn't hear of tithe in the New Testament church. I want people to note that in the early church. So offerings in the early church, there were two types. Giving to share among the believers and giving to help the poor. So we shall read the next scripture. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. Praise the Lord. No one commanded them. People on their own realized some people were poor in their midst. They saw what they had and brought so that everybody would share. That's free will. There was no command. Why didn't they ask them to bring the tithes of their produce, of their increase? Shall we read the next scripture? For you see, the believers in Macedonia and Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Here, you can see in Romans chapter 15, verse 26. You see, believers in Macedonia knew that people were poor among the believers in Jerusalem. And so they decided to give offerings. So whenever you, in the New Testament church, there were offerings to aid the poor. It was never to aid the apostles. It was never to aid anybody else. Praise the Lord. We shall go to the fourth item, the Jerusalem Council. 
This council defined what the Gentile Christians would be held accountable for. Shall we read the next scripture? Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay down upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Praise the Lord for his word. Let us read what Christ told his disciples in Matthew chapter 16 verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Praise the Lord for his word. And please pay attention. I interpret Christ's pledge to his church. His churches, his apostles, or his disciples in council with the Holy Spirit presiding. Not group of human beings absent the Holy Spirit. Here in this place, the apostles, the leaders of the church, with the Holy Spirit determined what the Gentiles were to be held accountable for. And when Christ told them, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which many have misinterpreted, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will lose in heaven. He was making a prophetic. It was a prophecy of that Jerusalem council, which he could see ahead. Because that Jerusalem council meeting would be the greatest consequence. In fact, had the greatest consequence on the church. And will have it until Christ comes back to his church. Praise the Lord. Because it was on that date that the church of God came into maturity. It was on that date that the Gentiles, that's the rest of the world, were admitted into fellowship with the Jews. It was on that date that the unity of the Jewish and Gentile believers into one body of Christ was consummated. It was on that date that the church affirmed that there cannot be any discrimination in any gathering of God's people. It was on that date that there's no more trying to get Gentiles to become Jews and keep the law. Those who have brought the law back into the church are wicked. No one should ever again bring believers into the bondage of the law and thereby negate Christ's finished works on the cross. That was the import of the Jerusalem Council. Shall we read the next scripture? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Praise the Lord for the reading from Galatians chapter 1. According to Galatians chapter 3 verse 23 to 26, it says, Before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. Kept for the faith that would afterwards be revealed. Therefore, the law is the tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So after Christ had come, the law is done. We are children of the faith, faith in Christ. We became sons of God by faith in Christ's finished works at the Calvary, not by the law. Therefore, our Christian work must continue by that same faith if we are not to lose focus and make a shipwreck of our faith. The 21st century liberty of many believers have been stolen by worldly prosperity preaching pastors and general overseers. Repeat that to yourself. They have guilt trimmed their followers into believing that they must give large offerings and pay tithes for them to receive God's blessings. They have taken scriptures out of context. 
sliced, dice them to fit into their narrative, which only serves their bellies. That's their creature comforts and mammon. Shall we go to the next item on the outline? Fighting in the New Testament is the doctrine of human beings. And I want to say, the Lord's condemnation of false teachers in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 to 9 is applicable even now. Shall we read that scripture? Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Praise the Lord for the reading of his word from Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 to 9. Before the 15th century, it was a sale of indulgences to obtain eternal salvation whereby the apostate church of that generation, of that century, said you have to sell indulgences, and then if you buy ABC, the pays amount of money, certain um, uh, years are reduced in purgatory, where, of course, there's no such thing as purgatory, because either Christ saved us on the cross, and our works are inconsequential, or he did not save us, and we have to aid God. In the 21st century, tithes and offerings have replaced indulgences. But is there really any difference between the Roman church's teaching then on indulgences and the teaching on tithes and offerings by 21st century churches and denominations? Blessings, more wealth, health, promotions, children, etc for those who faithfully deliver 10% of their monthly income and obviously little or no blessings for those who fail to pay up. Some have even gone to the extent of telling their followers that those who don't pay tithes will go to hell. How wicked! There are false prophets, false teachers, false pastors, false general overseers. If you are in such churches, run for your life. They are working for the devil. Praise the Lord. Is it any wonder that young men and women, rather than get a good education, or try and acquire skills that will enable them to feed themselves and their families, jump into ministry, fully believing that they'll be leaving all their congregation sweat, others will be working, and they will say, I'm pastor. Because for many, being a pastor or founder of a ministry is the key to wealth. I want to ask you, my listener, would that have been the case if tithes and offerings had not replaced Christ and the cross? I want you to ponder that as you go into your closet. How many young people would really have gone into ministry if they knew that they would have to fend for themselves and their families, just like our brother Paul. Shall we read the next scripture? I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Praise the Lord. Please go to your pastors and general overseers and read this scripture to them. And ask them, what does that mean? We shall go to the next item. On the outline, context of Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 to 11, which has been used and abused. Shall we read? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven 
and pour out for you such blessing that there will not bedroom, be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Praise the Lord for the reading of his word. How often and how loud have we had those verses of scripture from the pulpits? How many have felt obliged to pay tithes and give heavily for one church project or the other in the mistaken belief that God will be angry with them if they defaulted? Many are convinced that they will inherit eternal life because they have been tithing faithfully and giving very generously even though they do not have good Christian testimony. It is a sad testimony of how the rot has eaten so deep that a spirit-filled believer will be giving and paying tithes because he or she wants God to pay him or her back a hundredfold. How much did God repay those early Christians who gave their lives rather than accept the mutilation of the gospel? Had the early church had the 21st century Christianity mindset, there would have been no Christianity today. The early adherents of the gospel of Christ faced persecutions wherever they went. Many died in the Roman Coliseum. They sang even as they were being torn apart by beasts, while the Roman pagans jeered at them. The courage of those saints inspired many others. And that's how the gospel spread very rapidly. Those men and women torn apart by beasts did not pay tithes. They paid with their lives because they knew that they belonged 100% to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe in my heart that the Lord Jesus Christ stood up in heaven. Just like he did when Stephen was being martyred, as each of them gave their lives for the sake of the gospel. How many times has your pastor given the congregation the context of Malachi's warning in chapter 3, verses 10 to 11? There was a reason for that warning, which comes prior to verses 10 to 11. Shall we read? A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. It is you, O priests, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You place defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Praise the Lord. Malachi was a prophet of God in the time of Nehemiah. His message of judgment was to a people plagued by corrupt priests, wicked practices, and a false sense of security in their privileged relationship with God. Malachi was pleading with the people to return to the covenant God had with Israel, especially to the priests. The message in Malachi was about corrupt leadership and false teaching that has led the people to profane the Lord's altar. The people were even sacrificing items the Lord said were unfit. Defy food on the altar, blind animals for sacrifice, crippled or diseased animals. That's why what in that particular, in, if you want to read it, is in Malachi chapter 1 verses 6 to 8. That's the context of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 to 11. Anyone who tries to put a yoke again on believers has the antichrist spirit. 
Teachings that believers should pay tithes are false. It is another gospel. And that gospel is from human beings and from demons. Shall we move to the next item? What to do? Please note we are God's children. We are purchased with the blood of his son. Therefore we belong to God 100%. No room to maneuver. So I want to ask a question to those who claim tithing that they tithe or whatever that means. What happens to the 90% remaining if we give God only 10% of our earnings? I want to know what happens to God's 90%? Did God purchase only 10% of our lives where our life is soul, spirit and body and 10% of our talents, money and time? If the answer is no, then those who give God only 10% of their income, keeping 90% for themselves, feeling justified, they are actually stealing from God. They are actually stealing from God. God owns you and I if we have believed 100%. Everything we own belongs to him. God knows our individual circumstances, where we fellowship, and what plans he has for each of his children. Let him direct you and I on what we should give, whom to give it to, where to give, how to give, and when to give. Because God owns us 100% and we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Let us seek him to guide us. Brother John may be told everything this month to some poor people in his or her community. Sister Jane may be asked, don't bother, because God knows in one year's time, he is going to ask Sister Jane to do something in her community or in fellowship or whatever it is. Only God knows, because you belong to him, I belong to him if we are children of God. Let God direct you and I on our giving forget our word tight the moment you bring it in you are brought a law and if you brought it then you are bound to keep the whole law or you are sinning against God praise the Lord we are going to now pray I ask you to go to your closet take these scriptures listen to this broadcast again and ask the Lord 